three, and we are we are live with Timber Hawkeye. Welcome everybody to the Vortex Energy Podcast, and we've got Sue here as well, uh, Grandmother Sue. Uh, Timber is the best-selling author of the Buddhist Boot Camp and the book Faithfully Religionless. His books and the Buddhist Boot Camp podcast offer a secular and non-sectarian approach to being at peace with the world, both within and around us, with the intention to awaken, enlighten, enrich, and inspire. He's the author of two books, a mega podcast, and lots of other fun stuff. So welcome, Timber. Welcome to uh, the virtual Australian global reality show. <laughs> Aloha. I wish I was there in person. <laughs> That's great. So we were just chatting a little bit before we came on, and uh, one of the things that we were talking about was how so many people think they don't know how to meditate, they want to learn how to meditate, they don't know where to start. What What's your real key guide to how how do people how should people get started meditating? Well, the challenge I I encounter a lot is when people feel like they're doing it wrong. They 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 just give up. They say I can't do it because they've read books or they've listened to talks that tell them they have to sit a certain way and they have to cross their legs a certain way and their eyes have to be pointing at a forty five degree angle with you know <laughs> breathing in one nostril out the other. And, and of course they give up. And they feel like they're doing it wrong one reason is because at some point somewhere along the way someone told them there's a right way to do it and I think that's very counterproductive because you know painting can be meditative running can be meditative uh, gardening can be meditative it doesn't have to look a certain way and the moment you have a very concrete idea of how it's supposed to look then as long as you don't fit into that which ranges from day to day then you feel like you're doing it wrong and that's that's not the point of meditation it's just a way to Get your mind to focus on what you want it to focus on rather than letting it you know, run loose. It's, it's, it's the equivalent of having a puppy and when you take it out for a walk, it knows to stay on your side. But then when you get to the dog park, you take the leash off and it runs and it does what it wants. The mind is the same way. No problem with taking it off the leash and letting it brainstorm. Yeah. But when it comes time, let's say, to go to bed or to focus on something or to not focus on you want to be able to put a leash on it and have it sit by your side. And the only way to be able to do that is with practice. It's just every day, find some, one thing to focus on. It could be a prayer, it could be a mantra, it could be a breath, it could be gardening. And just as long as your mind doesn't wander while you're doing exactly that, you are essentially connected. I love that. You know, and I tell people all the time, there's a reason it's called the practice of meditation. Because it is a practice and you have to do it to to get better at it and to have any type of benefit. It takes does take that practice. Yeah. It's not that practice makes perfect. It's practice makes practice more practicable. You know, it's just <laughs> easier. And, and even if all you do is sit for five minutes and say, you know, for five minutes I'm not going to physically move. Just physically I'm not going to move. If, if there's an itch in the back of my head, I'm not going to scratch it. If there's, you know, my foot's falling asleep. I'm not going to rub it. I'm just for five minutes. When the timer goes off, sure, I'll do whatever I want. But for five minutes. And the benefit of those five minutes is not those five minutes. It's not just so you can tap yourself on the back and say, good job, you didn't move for five. It's so later in the day when something triggers you, when you're inclined to, you know, respond, react. Uh, you've practiced, you've exercised that muscle of not reacting. And you're essentially lengthening that gap between impulse and response. And that's what mindfulness is. In that gap, you can cross-reference what you're about to do with your core values, and then you you respond rather than react, if that makes sense. And that's that's the distinction between mindful action and mindless action. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. What, what do you think, Sue? Any comments? Yeah, it's, it's wonderful, the um, simplicity of of saying all that, and I've always taught people, well, when I've tried to help people meditate, I just tell them to listen, because the mind is in neutral when it's, when you're listening, it can't think and listen at the same time, so it's just a matter of, again, taking the time and, and practicing. 
And I wanted to just chat briefly about your book, uh, Buddhist Boot Camp, uh, because I think there are some many, many hidden gems all through it. And uh, I love that it's set up in a way that uh, you can pick up any chapter at any time or kind of open the book and see what um, see what falls into hits for you, what messages for you at that moment. So, Sue, what were some of your favorite parts of, of Timber's book, A Buddhist Boot Camp? It's just the simplicity of teaching and, and um, taking the woo-woo out of all the spirituality. It's just a normal growth rate and a normal part of life. And if we can do it simply and easily, it just is so much easier. And that's really striking. It brings everything back to basics and just teaches every, everything that is so easy to learn. That's how it should be taught. Yeah, no, you did you did phenomenal, Timber. That was great. So how did you come up with that name? Yeah, we do. <laughs> Both, actually. I was gonna ask that was gonna be the next question. <laughs> jumping into the deep end because, you know, very true to my nature is when someone suggested, let's say, when I was in the Tibetan temple and, and the Lama said, you know, why don't you try Zen instead because the Tibetan culture didn't quite resonate with me too much. I, I didn't just pick up a book on Zen. I moved into a Zen monastery. It's just kind of the way I do things. <laughs> yeah. And so trying to put a title to all of it, Buddhist boot camp is really what it felt like. And the book, because it's, as you said, a, it's so short, it's it, Every chapter is only a page long, and you can read them in any order because it's just a collection of emails. You can essentially pick up any page and just read that without necessarily it relating to the chapter before or after. And my name, my goodness, I talk about it in the second book, and faithfully religionless, uh, when I moved from Israel to the States, no one could pronounce my birth name. It was Tomer Gal, which ironically enough means, uh, Tomer means, means palm tree. And God, the last name, which my parents made up when they got married, means ocean wave. <laughs> so my parents named me Palm Tree Ocean Wave, and I ended up living in Hawaii for 10 years. But, this is <laughs> awesome. but because my parents made up uh, their last name, I felt very free to do the same. And back in 1995, when my first graphic design was published, uh, the company for which the logo was created wanted to know what name to put on it, and they said Timber. And Ask what's Timber's last name. I don't have a last name. It doesn't have a last name. It's just it's been my nickname since I moved to the states because no one knows the phone number. So I, I, I felt just frozen. In, in, I was first year of college, and you know they were in New York. I was in California, and they didn't care about the story about my parents and the, their last name. They just wanted a name so they could hang up the call and make the next one. And, I lived on Hawkeye Street, so I said Hawkeye, and I hung up the phone, and, and then I thought, you know, Timber Hawkeye, that's, that's pretty good, so I had it legally changed. I'm sorry it's not a more heroic story, but that's the truth, that's what the name came from. <laughs> I like the origins of your original name as well, uh, it could, you could have just been called uh, Greater Ocean Wave. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> that's great. So tell us a little bit about your philosophy is completely non-sectarian, and you go into this a lot in actually both of your books, a little bit about um, your different faiths you've been exposed to. How is it for you that you've come really full circle to just say you're embracing all types of uh, spirituality and however somebody may perceive them? How, how did you come to that place? generating my own, not so much by adding things to my life to make it simple, but by looking at my life and figuring out what's making it complicated, how can I take it out, you know, and when I did that and I just started removing the very things that cause our anguish, 
I realized I'm essentially living a monastic life. Like this is, I was a monk before I knew what a monk was, before I even took my monastic vows. And so it wasn't so much that I sought, you know, monastic living or, or spiritual teachings or anything. I was looking for, you know, the, the, essentially the answer of how are we creating our own suffering? You know, what, what part of me is doing that? And, and it, I guess first it's to stop blaming other people for my suffering and realize that I'm creating it myself. And when I realized I'm doing it, then I thought, well, how can I stop? And so I eliminated the very things that cause it, whether it be taking things personally or overthinking things or thinking that I know anything with any certainty. That was a big one. As soon as I realized the only thing I know for certain is that I don't know anything for certain. <laughs> yeah. essentially making them wrong so I can be right or, or making myself superior by making them inferior. I didn't need to do any of that. I just was open to hearing what anyone has to say. And that's why the first principle in Buddhist boot camp is that the opposite of what you know is also true to somebody else, somewhere else, depending on their time, place, and circumstance. And as soon as I can make peace with that, that, that someone who believes the exact opposite of me is also correct. It's, that's their truth. That's their reality then I don't need to prove them wrong. I don't need to fight with them. I just I just listen with an open heart and open mind to understand how is it that your truth is so different from mine. And I started studying both religion and psychology simultaneously to understand not just what people believe, but why we believe what we do. That's the, that's the juicy stuff. That's the really interesting, like, how did you get to where you are? And it doesn't matter where someone is, there is a logical explanation to every single part of it. It doesn't matter if you're part of the Ku Klux Klan or if you're an entrepreneur and and you know creating uh, nonprofit organizations to help people all over the world. Even both of them are contributed by certain decisions and events. And when you stop with the judgment and you just look at it as what contributed to all of that, then you can follow the dots. You can connect it and go. Well, that actually makes sense. I understand why you joined the clan, or I understand why, you know, you hate who you hate, or you, you're preconditioned to date who you're dating, you know, it, it all makes sense, and then, you, when you have understanding, you've dropped judgment, it's kind of like Sue was saying earlier, that, that two things uh, not coexist, so to speak, you know, your, your mind can't process two opposing thoughts at the same time. And that's what causes dis-ease. That's what causes conflict within us. And so, like, you can't be grateful to be married and angry at your spouse at the same time. <laughs> the moment you are angry at your spouse is the moment you've forgotten how grateful you are to have them in your life. Yeah. And when you go back to gratitude, the anger goes away. It's it's one or the other. I don't know if that makes any sense at all, but it's, it's that whole cognitive dissonance plus spirituality kind of marrying each other. You know, it makes perfect sense, and I think particularly in our times and particularly in the U.S. and around the world where we have people of great political um, confrontations and spiritual and religious confrontations, which is how most of our wars are occurring uh, today and probably have occurred for many thousands and thousands of years. Um, but I just see people going even more separate, so that was to me one of the most meaningful parts of that came to me from your uh, the first book. Uh, how do you look at somebody who has the complete opposite idea from you and simply listen and try to understand? And doing that with compassion was um, is I think the greatest challenge most of us face today because we all want to believe we're on the right side. See, I don't want. I don't. I'm not. I'm not attached to being right. I yeah. Yeah, I I get that, and that's but that's the I think that's the hardest thing for most humans to let go of. Yeah, well, then there's your suffering. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and that's yeah. what so much of Buddhism is, is around letting go because if you can let go, you know, and I tell people to let go of old dishes they don't need anymore, old clothes, or old towels that are moldy and still there, or clothes that don't fit, or whatever. The benefit is not necessarily. Because you're exercising that muscle of loosening your grip, of, 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 be, 
being with the flow. And if you can start letting go of some of the junk in your house, you can then let go of old opinions, beliefs, judgments, the junk in your own head. It's all connected. It's all related. And the way we do one thing is the way we do all things. So if we habitually cling to everything, then it's going to be really hard to let go. I saw a quote that said, everything I've ever let go of had claw marks in it. It's not to give all up. It's just to loosen our grip. And even on the idea that we are right about it, that anyone is right about anything, is so liberating. Yeah. You know, and I take it to an extreme in the second book. I say, you know, if somebody if somebody tells me the sky is green and I believe it to be blue, I don't need to argue with them. I don't need to tell them it isn't. I don't need to say, Alexa, what color is the sky? You know, I don't need to get a bunch of people <laughs> to agree with me. I just walk away from that experience knowing that the sun is blue, the sky looks green. And I can do that. You asked how, why is that so difficult? I can do that because the blueness of my sky is not at all jeopardized by how green someone else perceives it to be. Mm. My sky is still just as blue. So there's no need to, to, to be right and to have a blue sky. I can just have a blue sky. They can have a green sky. And wheels are the best. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, so Timber, let's. are you ready for some... Yeah, we'd like to get your... Your work out to the, the political masses <laughs> and to all humans. Well, they're, they're teaching us a very important lesson as well. And that's, that's I think, the, the, the kind of the appropriate response is to look at whatever is happening and instead of judging it as good or bad or horrible or wonderful, and just look at all of it and go, well, that's interesting. Yeah. And, and just stay there. Interesting is neutral. And, and trusting, you know, it's whatever is going on, it's to go, you know, if something is not aligned with my values, then I'm not going to go and fight against what I'm against. That's, that just adds more power to it. It lives me, you know, white knuckled and, and fighting. And so I often invite people, if something doesn't sit well with you, if you're witnessing something that you feel is unjust or whatnot, don't fight against it. You know, find, what are you for? And fight for that instead of against something else. So, you know, don't I don't know how else to say, like, promote what you love instead of bashing what you hate. If you're going to use your energy, use it for that end, if that makes sense. Absolutely makes perfect sense. You know, and that's, uh, we see it a lot, particularly in uh, Tasmania here, which has some of the purest environment on the planet. Um, we have some of the oldest trees. We have uh, the purest water. Uh, we've got the Antarctica uh, bringing up the cool, clean water. And so we see a lot of people... Um, really divided here. It, do we are we a logging state or are we the cleanest, purest state? And so, learning how to everyone, how do you live and create the positive version of that state versus dissolve, trying to diss the negative side of what someone may perceive is happening. So we see it on a very. Yeah. Like when you start hating the hater, you become yeah. a hater. So exactly. it doesn't matter what the vision is. And, and I think adding the words, you know, for now to the end of every sentence and according to me at the end of every sentence is really, really freeing because you can say, you know, it's got some of the nicest water for now. It's yeah. got some of the most pristine <laughs> beaches for now. You yeah. Know, that's just and because everything is in a constant state of change. And so. You're loosening your grip on, but we have to keep it this way. It's like, no, you don't. It, it is what it is, and it's going to go through its natural flow. And if Mother Nature gets too upset, she'll do what she's going to do anyway, and we're just going to have to learn to live with it. And it's just, are we part of the, the angry, the hateful, the hurtful, the I, it has to be my way? Or is it just, you know, how do we bring peace into the world if we're not at peace with ourselves? You know, if we're not peaceful... Because I saw someone the other day who was, was a very angry peace activist. And I just, I don't think he saw the topic that. You know? I don't think he got it. I, I, we see that a lot. I think, uh, I think that's a very common thing going on these days. And so I, I love your, your concept of, of being able to see both sides and, and allow forgiveness and understanding on both sides. And even if you don't see both sides, just honor the fact that there are always things between, like, what, three sides to every story. <laughs> you know, and, and Gandhi said that true
true happiness is when what we think, what we say, and what we do are all in alignment. And so how can we possibly live in that alignment with our values if we're not even clear about what they are? Yeah. So I think the most important thing to do when, when we get triggered or something happens is to go back and look at, at our own and, and write down our values. You know, be really clear. You know, we expect nonprofit organizations to tell us what their vision statement is, what their values are. We, we want it to be on their website. We want them to be listed. And, and then we hold them up to living in mind with those values. But individually, we don't do that. You know, we just, I, I travel all over the world and, and I've been and stayed with, you know, very angry vegans, for example. <laughs> you know how to tell if someone's vegan. You know, they'll tell you. And, and it's just amazing that, that they'll be out there protesting and angry and telling people what they should and shouldn't eat. And then they'll get into their car with their leather seats. Or they'll go home and they'll use their toothbrush, a toothpaste that's tested on animals. It's like, just sweep your own heart stew, you know? Just take care of this. Yeah. And because there's plenty there. You know, there's plenty for all of us to do here at home. But before we start telling other people what they, what they should and shouldn't do according to us, the almighty and all-knowing force of the universe. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. Are you ready for some quick questions, Timber? Sure. What's been the greatest spiritual lesson in, in all of this for you? Letting go, I think. Not just, I don't know. Just not knowing. Not being comfortable with not knowing. Um, and, yeah, that's the greatest. It, it, it's the, no matter what happens, it's just go back to... What is it that I'm clinging to? And what part of me is, is arguing here? What part of me is... And it's always the ego, you know? It, it, like, the God within doesn't doesn't need to prove itself. It just sits there quietly. It's like, you know what to do. But the ego, man. So I just check in with me and go, where where is this coming from? What, where is that feeling or that need or whatever? Where is it coming from? And if it's from the ego, I just don't pay it any attention. And I just let it go. It's a very long answer. I apologize. No, not at all. That was great. So what? how do you define consciousness? Well, I think from a very early age, we've uh, been raised with the concept through cartoons that there's like an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other, you know, and, <laughs> and we're just like trying to figure out what's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. And it's not about, you know, eternal damnation versus bliss. And it's not, I think when we're trying to, figure out what to do, we're neither the angel nor the devil. We're the ones sitting here watching that conversation happen. Mm. So that's the concept. If we can step back into our consciousness and be aware that there's a part of us judging what's happening, but not identify with that part, but just be aware that, hey, there's a part of me that's getting very triggered right now. And that's not who I am. That's just part of, I don't know if that makes any sense. So consciousness is the observer of that conversation. Absolutely, being the observer. I love it. Yeah. Yes, the observer. Yeah. And what is your definition of God? <laughs> uh, I would say whenever I try to define one word, I always think, well, what would be the opposite? Because then I have a better understanding. When someone asks me, what is mindfulness? It's like, well, what's mindlessness? And they go, well, that's easy. I'm like, okay, then the opposite of that is mindfulness. <laughs> and so if I think of God, the opposite of that to me would be, in a sense, the ego. So if anything is self-centered, self-serving, mindless and, and short-sighted, then the God within is selfless. It's it's caring, giving, forgiving, kind. It's it's the it's the part that takes care of all. It's it's not it's not one. It's all. You know, or understanding that all are one. Whatever it is, it's it's the awareness, if nothing else. And so, when we check in with the God within, you know, because we have it's it's funny that we have like the word Namaste. You know, the God in me sees the God in you, and. Right, and that's go. beautiful because we realize that, that there's a higher power, there's some energy, there is some, you know, wise guru within each of us. And every once in a while we take that moment to acknowledge, hey, there's that divinity that's inside of me is also inside of you. However, we don't have a word for the ego in me sees the ego in you. you know, I think it would be really 
like how cool to have that. Because then when someone acts out of ego, I'm like, hey, I, I get that. Yeah, I get why you're doing what you're doing. I get why you're being selfish. I've been there, you know. And so there's no judgment. I, the ego in me sees the ego in you. I get it. And so I, I, I think it's that distinction between um, selfless and selfish. That's the best way I can put it. Hmm. Interesting. Sue, any co any comments? Any you'd like to jump in here? No, it's basically just as you said, it's like an acceptance of life versus a non-acceptance of life. And you stop feeling you have to change it, then you're basically happy in yourself and accepting yourself for who you are. It's, it's, again, a very simple, easy, complex to learn, uh, thing to learn. It's just. Doing it, it's not that easy. And I don't know if we need so much to learn anything new so much as unlearn all the other stuff we picked up along the way. I think naturally our natural state understands this. Our natural state understands being at peace and being kind and, and being caring. It's just that we've learned how to be fearful and hateful and judgmental. And so we need to just unlearn all of that and go back to our natural state of peace. Yeah, nice. So, Timber, what does your spiritual practice look like on a daily basis these days? I, I, like a routine? I don't, I mean, yeah. it's just, my life is, is very much like everyone else's. I just, I, I think, again, with mindfulness being nothing more than the gap between impulse and action, then I would say that the difference would just be that gap is I, I introduce that gap between uh, my feeling hunger and what I'm eating and in that gap I cross-reference okay what I'm about to eat and is it in line with my core values and if it is then I move forward what I'm about to say is it in line with my core values then I go ahead and do it any step I make is just I always cross-reference it with my core values to make sure that I'm not creating dis-ease within me that I'm not creating conflict within me where I say one thing and do another so I live a life just like everybody else. I, I except I, I did make a commitment to only work part time so I can live full time, and that was very liberating in and of itself. I talk a lot about that. In, I think both books. Yeah, yeah, YouTube yeah. I love it. My podcast and all of that. So does your does your current um, your activities on your spiritual practices and your books and things does that. Do you, do you still keep a second part-time job, or is that enough of kind of a part-time job uh, in itself? I, I created a publishing house for my second book because I didn't want to publish through the big publisher again. And halfway through the second book tour, I realized that I now have a publishing house for just one title, which is really silly. And so I now publish other authors, and I've been doing out. Uh, I'm a Lyft driver, so that's another thing that I do uh, in my downtime. Cool. Uh, and 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 the job itself, you know, I give talks. Uh, it doesn't, it, and that's the non-paying part, you know, because I never charge for my talks or anything like that. And I go and I speak at uh, correctional facilities and rehab clinics and recovery centers and high schools, and so that keeps me pretty busy. In a I wanted to dive deep into that because I know that you spent a lot of time working with the correctional facilities and specifically uh, your books uh, you're using in many, many facilities. Can you give us an idea of how many of your books that you know of have been given to the correctional facilities? Oh, thousands. Thousands. because uh, every time somebody buys a copy of a book from my website, another copy is donated to the Prison Library Project, and they get 300 letters a week from inmates asking for spiritual books that aren't necessarily Christian. And so they just have stacks and stacks of my books there to just almost like leaflet them out. And uh, so I, and the same thing with high schools. Uh, Buddhist Boot Camp is required reading in a few high schools uh, across the U.S. And I go and I, and I speak to them. So it's, I, I don't keep track of any of that. It's just constant. It's just that, that's like, just so fantastic. Yeah, yeah.
No, I love it. I think that's that's absolutely amazing. And I think that's clearly uh, because what I love best about your books is just they're written in a very easy conversational style. Uh, I think that a lot of people are going to be able to absorb the messages that you're sending in a uh, story like way. I think it's um, I think that's the greatest asset of your books that the average person's going to be able to read it and go, wow, that's that's really that's significant. Fantastic. So what do you think happens when we die, Timber? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, None of us obviously know for real. <laughs> and, and I'm okay with not knowing so much so that I, you know, I proceed with uh, curiosity, not with fear. Just the way I have through my living part is uh, proceed with curiosity, not with fear. And the only thing that keeps me double guessing or you know thinking about maybe this whole reincarnation thing is real is when you meet a five-year-old or you hear about a five-year-old who just wrote a symphony or something <laughs> and you're like okay wait a minute you clearly did not learn this in the last five years on earth where is that from and that's, that's the only thing that gets me thinking that maybe there's some residual knowledge with which we are born from a previous life that we kind of pick up where we left off and, and get going and what end? I can only imagine so we can learn to be completely selfless. And if we don't learn it in one lifetime, we'll, we'll just pick up where we left off until we get to that point of getting to live a completely selfless life uh, for the benefit of all. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I just wanted to bring that up because I know you talked about it recently in, in one of your blogs that we don't often talk about dying or the fact that this is a finite little universe that we, that we live in here. Uh, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that was great. And so, Timber, what advice would you give someone just starting out on their spiritual path? That is a great line. Very good. <laughs> yeah. And what's so, Timber? What's the best way for people to reach out to you who want more information about what you do and uh, the sharing of all of your thoughts and your your process and your path? Well, I, I try to make the message available. The message has enriched my own life so much that keeping it to myself just felt again very very selfish. And so the only thing I could do was share it with others. And what made the most sense is to meet people where they are. So it's on Facebook through Buddhist Boot Camp. There's a Buddhist Boot Camp website. BuddhistBootCamp.com. There is the Buddhist Boot Camp YouTube. There's a Buddhist Boot Camp podcast. You know wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, just wherever people are, uh, there's the Buddhist Boot Camp Instagram page. You know it's just meeting where people are rather than having them go somewhere else and offering it to them in, in the same format language that we can then apply to our daily lives. So I think if you just go to BuddhistBootCamp.com, you'll see all the options there. The blog, the, the podcast, the Facebook page, the Instagram, the Insta Prisons Project, the journal, the, everything. It's all there. Fantastic. You know, tell us a little bit about your new journal. I um, I know that's coming out. We didn't we didn't get a chance to dive into that. You knew. Yeah. So it's it's a monthly journal with daily food for thought. Someone had asked me, you know, because I focus so much on all of us being very clear about what our core values are. And someone recently asked me, well, what if I don't know what my core values are? Can you give them to me? And I said, absolutely not. <laughs>
have a clear idea of the kind of person you want to be, the kind of life you want to lead, and what your values are. And so I figured if I do a monthly journal with daily questions, that no, no two days are the same, and, and just pick a theme for each month, uh, then by the end of the year, by the end of someone really going through that process of contemplating for just you know five minutes every day, some simple questions. It's not just a you know, question and response like, what are you grateful for today? Which we tried last year and it was great, but it, it kind of lost its momentum halfway through the year. So creating a separate one for each month, I think, is the, the new way to go. And, and so the journal is available, but only the January one so far. I essentially committed to writing 11 more books this year. <laughs> and that's yeah. terrifying. But, yeah. but Fantastic. So I really encourage everybody to go check out um, all the places that Timber is available. And I really loved his, uh, both of his books. I think Buddhist Boot Camp uh, was my favorite of the two, if, if I had to pick a favorite. But um, so... <laughs> okay. Oh, cool. So can you finish these sentences, Timber? The world needs. Love it. I believe in. Nice. Love is. Mm. I would like to thank. Nice. And I'm ready to forgive. Some of these may not apply to you. You may have already done all that work, that forgiveness. Yeah, I can't think of anyone else. I'm, I'm ready to forgive whoever is going to cause me harm in the future. Mm. They're already forgiven. <laughs> nice. Nice. Sue, do you have any questions for Timber before we wrap up? teaching I think this is just marvelous and I'm just so grateful that there's people out there now leading the way and yes you are leading the way it's just a um, difference from everybody following they actually can walk along beside you rather than following a dogma or a type of religion or anything like that it's, it's the kind of leadership the world needs now thank you I, I, I appreciate that because my intention is not to create a path and tell people follow this path and it'll lead you to where I, my intention is to perhaps give everyone a machete with which they can create their own path through the jungle of their minds, you know? It's just Because if you follow a path, you're going to end up where someone else ended up. And I'm not suggesting everyone needs to do what I did. Only that when we encounter an obstacle that we have the tools with which to overcome. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. When I, years, years and years ago when I first started out thinking properly, I I knew I wanted to grow spiritually, but I had to define what the end product would be, so I knew what to grow towards. And um, it was very difficult, but I eventually came up with finding your own path and becoming purely just who you are. And that means you can't follow anything else. And I've always been very independent, so it's a reasonably easy path for me to follow. But I did hit a lot of brick walls. And until I figured things out a bit better, but it, it's just we have to find our own way. We can't follow. We can't go another person's way. But we need the tools with which to do that. And I think when we see someone else who has found their own way, 
it's very encouraging. It's very empowering to say, you know, that they're not Superman, you know, that like I can do what they did, you know, and, and that means I can pick up, I can, if I don't have the tools, I can pick them up. And that's the benefit of reading books or listening to other people's stories is it's not to follow their path. It's to pick up tools along the way and learn how to, to build our own. We're saying the same thing, and so I'm really grateful you you realized it's not about. I think it was uh, Stephen Mitchell who wrote the book Buddhism Without Beliefs and Confessions of a Buddhist Atheist. <laughs> uh, wonderful, wonderful books. And it's a great title. That, you know, when we think of a journey, when we think of a, the spiritual path, we think of a path through the forest where you know all obstacles have been removed, and it's like, oh, there's the path. It's like, well. Again, like I said earlier, that's someone else's. Uh, and so if we encounter an obstacle, we think, well, this this might not be where I need to be. It's like, no, the, the obstacle is part of your journey. <laughs> Overcoming it is part of your growth. So I'm glad you, you strapped on those boots and challenged on Trailblazer. <laughs> I also had a, a wonderful teacher who was a, a, a great influence in my life. And First thing he said we need to do is get rid of our beliefs. So I thought, oh, I've worked hard for them. Why, why am I getting rid of them? But they are very, pick very them up again, But it's good to drop them. You drop them and then maybe pick them up again. But if we don't question them, if we don't question what, why do I believe what I believe, then it just kind of becomes part of our habitual pattern, which often works against us, not for us. Sounds like you had a really great teacher. That's awesome. Very lucky. Yeah, well, fantastic. Well, thank you for coming on, Timber. And uh, really love uh, reading your books and seeing what else you come out with and uh, following you on Facebook. I haven't jumped on the, your Instagram page. I'll have to find you on Instagram. And uh, looking forward to staying connected. So thank you. Thank you.